door knocking is uh, we try to we try to get contracts <coughs> to be to build up for gospel sharing to do door knocking because they're much more successful. We had one at uh, West Freeway last year. We had about uh, 12, 13 baptisms, and I think 19 for the year. But uh, but they they really do a good job. But but most of those came from contacts. So building contacts is what you want to do if you want to grow your church. And you can make contacts from different ways. I, I don't want to go into it today, but Home Mission can help you to build contacts. We have, we have a book called the Home Mission Handbook that will uh, give you a lot of ideas in your congregation to reach out and to get uh, community service in your area. Now then, uh, today, uh, Jonathan, could you help me pass this out, please? Thank you so much for coming. I want to share, we, we have a lot of people that we went around to, and they just went everybody. Yeah. And they told us that um, they, uh, 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 they told us that they don't feel comfortable with a lot of the Bible studies out there with the questions and answers because uh, we have one more. Uh, because they're afraid that people are going to ask questions. And so, uh, instead of, there's a lot of great studies out there. OBS, Back to the Bible, I mean, so many good studies. And we recommend them all. And if you can use those and you like using them, then that's great. But the majority of your congregation has probably never but we estimate 90% of the congregations, 90% uh, of the people in congregations have never held an organized Bible study. Here's what happens. You meet your neighbor out here. You start talking to them. Then the first thing they ask you about, why don't you have music in the church? Or, or, you, know, or you start talking about baptism because you want to baptize them on the spot. And guess what you don't have in your hand? A Bible. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the worst thing you can do is talk to people about the Bible without a Bible. So, you you know, how many of you carry guns in your car? I don't want to see your hand. <laughs> in Texas, nearly everybody does, but you need to carry a Bible in your car. That's a lot more important because you can whip it out. And uh, um, and if you need Bibles, let us know. We'll, we'll help you. Home Mission has worked with over 600 congregations in the last eight I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. Worked with over 600 congregations in the last eight years. And while about 100 congregations are closing their doors each year in America, we've had less than 2% that have closed their doors that the ones we work with. And, and that's all God. All God. And we're still learning and we're still writing material and we're still thinking about ways that we can do things better. And we call people, and we may work with a congregation for years. We don't just come and go. So we came up with this Bible study that we call a Bible study with training wheels. And the ones that we teach uh, that, have, that use it, we've had some, especially if you get your ladies to start using it in the congregation, uh, in, in teaching other ladies, you'll be surprised at the outcome. I know one congregation in Iowa that the, this is all the preacher uses. And he's had over 30 baptisms using it. He said when he gets down to <coughs> baptism, he said he's had 100% uh, obeying the gospel when he gets to that point. There are only three lessons, and it's designed in such a way, and I was an outreach minister for eight and a half years, but before that I worked on uh, other things, and I had a Bible study called Starting Over. But again, a lot of people that I'd go out and help train, they, they would get mixed up and bum fuzzled when somebody would ask a question, or, or they didn't exactly know how to make a square peg fit in a round hole, and so... We just wrote it out. Now, the first part of this study is 
if you'll open your books. Oh, and by the way, two of the women of that congregation in Iowa have baptized. One, is, one has brought four people to Christ, and the other one has brought three. Amen. And one of the men is using it, and he's brought uh, three or four people to Christ. I mean, they, in other words, they they love it because they don't have to they don't have to think about it. And if they ask the question. There are four magic words that you need to remember. That's a good question. <laughs> four magic words. You know that, brother. <laughs> and uh, when you when you use those words, then uh, you you write down the question and say, you know, we we will be getting to that at a at a future time. And unless they insist on it, say, well, let's get back together next week and we'll talk about that before we get into our lesson. So that gives you a week to study. Now, if you'll notice, right at the front, you got an envelope in there. Did everybody get an envelope in there? Okay, this is important. Now, there's just a brief introduction about the story of Jesus. And then on page four, you get their... Uh, salvation experience. Everybody thinks they're saved. You ever notice that? How many people you study with say, well, I'm lost? <laughs> Maybe about one out of every 50. <laughs> Everybody thinks they're saved. And when you go through this, a lot of them are still going to think they're saved. There's a way to work with this. I remember when I was a young adult, my wife and I would have people over and we'd show the Jill Miller film strip that visualized Bible study on the wall. And uh, and we had a record player, and so that tells you how old I am. Anyway, but uh, we showed it on the wall, and then we get down to baptism, and we'd say, well, are you ready to be baptized? I said, well, no, I've already been baptized. You have to get their salvation story before you get into any study. And you can do that in two ways. You can do it this way, or you can do it in the way uh, that we call hopes. Jonathan, would you mind go getting uh, some hopes cards, please? Thank you. Jonathan is my youngest son, and he's my smallest son, too. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, he pats me on the head and he says, you are a right, little man. <laughs> but you ask them, you know, do you believe Jesus Christ the Son of God? Yes or no. They're just simple yes or no answers. Uh, do you love Jesus Christ with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength? Now think long and hard before you answer this question. Does your life reflect this? Do you believe it necessary to attend worship? You're building a framework so that when they answer these questions, when you get to that point, then you can really hone in on it. Now, here's a, here's a great thing about this, is that if you want to have a workshop at your congregation on the rest of the story, we're going to do something very similar, only expanded from what we're doing right now. And we also give a book called Soul Saving Tools. This is the workshop but you got to do the work. And so the soul saving tools is taking about three quarters of a year and going through it and practicing on each other with it. We just finished uh, the latest one we did that was with Camden Avenue in uh, Parkersburg, West Virginia. And uh, they're, they're waiting on their new revised books. We revise these things all the time. Somebody said, oh, did you know you had an E before an I in the Word? Well, oh. <laughs> so, we, you have to, there's only one thing that doesn't need to be revised, and that's the Word of God. Everything else needs to be revised from time to time. Uh, anyway, uh, they're going through, the, we went through this, and uh, in 2020, 2022, they had two baptisms. In 2023, I hadn't gotten the final count yet, but they were up to about 16. 
And so they've really gotten excited and they're, they're working and bringing people to Christ. And now they're going to go ahead and start working on this and practicing on each other. Now, the, the good thing about this is, is that there's a follow-up to this called Foundations for Disciples Aftercare. Are you locked out? Oh, okay. <coughs> Next time I'm charging five bucks to get back in. <laughs> okay, would you hand that out to everybody, please? Yeah. You've got to get this out. Now, what you do is, is you once they filled it out, <coughs> and you can ask them the question, and you can fill it out. It doesn't make any difference. But you tear it out, and you put it in this envelope, and you write their name on it, and you save it for lesson three. Now, if you get through the if you get through lesson three and they're not baptized and they still think that they're saved, then this foundations for disciples aftercare, you go right into it. You say, I know you want to be a good follower, a good disciple of Christ, don't you? And they'll literally always say yes. And so you say, Can we continue then with the foundations for disciples? You know. <coughs> Bringing people to Christ is not a one and done situation. It takes time. And once you bring them to Christ, you got to keep them. It's so exciting to go out here and baptize this person and this family and that person and everything. Boy, you just want to baptize the world. And then you run off and leave these people that you baptize. Well, we, we can't do that. So, Home Mission has come up with three different things to help with new Christians. And the foundation is a big part of it for disciples. Now then, once you have this and you've torn this out and you put it in the uh, envelope, then you keep it with their name on it. And you say, we'll talk about this at the end of lesson number three. Now I want to show you how smoothly this works. It really does work well. Uh, the text is written out. You read the text if you're studying with them, and they read the scripture. It's in the New King James. And the in the scriptures, I uh, said, do we need did somebody else need it in here? I don't know. Someone was looking at it. They, they counted it left. Sir? They just counted. Oh, just counted. Okay. Well, as long as they don't discount us, we'll be all right. <laughs> uh, lesson one, Jesus and sin. Now Jonathan is going to uh, Always, when I do this, I have somebody out in the audience that does the. Uh, uh, do you have it on your phone? Have what? Oh, this. Yeah, yeah. All the highlighted ones. You read the highlighted ones. All right. Let me show you how it, how it works. Now, when you're studying with them, always pause at the end of a punctuation mark. That gives them time to digest what you're talking about. If you ever read scripture to them, anything that you do, always pause at a punctuation mark. Because then it allows you, allows them to take in what you're saying and they'll stay with you better. Lesson number one, Jesus and sin. Lesson two is Jesus the Savior. Lesson three is Jesus and salvation. Do you know the six deadly words that can ruin your life and cost you your eternal soul? <laughs> I mean, that's when you cue me. Okay, all right. The Apostle John said, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. First John 2, 15 through 17. So what are the six deadly words? I feel the lust of the flesh. I want the lust of the eye. I think the pride of life. What are you setting them up for? You're setting up saying, well, I, I believe this, or I think this, or I, I, I don't feel like you know, I don't have to do this. You're setting them right off the bat. 
you're setting them up to deal with that. You might say we all have eye trouble. In fact, sin is a three-letter word with I in the middle of it. So what is sin and why should that concern us? Paul stated, Therefore, just as though one man, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men, because all sin, for the law, for until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Because of Adam's sin and his example, what do we all inherit? Sin or death? Death. 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 <clears throat> when is sin imputed or charged against us? When we were born or when we knowingly break God's law? Knowingly break God's law. Do innocent children suffer physical death even though they have not sinned? Yes. Yeah. Yes. They do. Uh, you know, in this passage he says, uh, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned. Little children. Next one. All right. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do you have a problem with any of these? Well, everybody has a problem with these. Mm -hmm. And if they now, if they want to talk about their problems, what they're going through, or something, one of these that's really a problem, listen, listen very carefully, and make make a notation of it. You can use it later. King David, who lived over 3,000 years ago, was one of God's favorites. It was said of him that he was a man after God's own heart. David proclaimed, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. And yet David had a man murdered after he committed adultery with the man's wife. He was exposed for his sin by the prophet Nathan. David was also told the child born out of wedlock would die. Would you write off such a man and despise him for what he did? And yet, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay. This, I think you can see how easily this flows. And they'll, they'll follow right along with you and stay up with you. It's kind of like a kind of like revving your engine a little bit uh, to get it up to where it, it'll move. Those old cars, when they went up, I mean the Model T's and stuff, when they go up a hill, they couldn't make it all the way because <laughs> the gas, you know, would, would come would come down this way and in and, and the tank and, and uh, they couldn't they couldn't make it up there. Well, when you need to, what you're doing is, is you're building as you're asking these questions and they're reading the scripture and that's where the power is the power is in the word now i'm just going to go over briefly what these things do first of all you're going to ask them about uh you're going to ask them uh, uh you say this does not excuse murder or adultery or any other sin but that is who we are Many people believe that if you do good deeds and keep the Ten Commandments, you will be saved. But what if you were to base your salvation on keeping the Ten Commandments? How many have you broken at least once? And sometimes I use uh, the uh, illustration of, uh, of, a of a gallon of distilled water. How many drops of sewerage does it take to contaminate that water? Just one. Just one. 
And so if they say, well, I've done some of these sins, but I haven't done that many. Well, you know, that's where that comes in. You can use your own illustrations with that. We go through all of these Ten Commandments, and we, we have either uh, a question about it, or we have a scripture in dealing with it. And, uh, boy, that one in Ezekiel 14, he said, I will, I will, the one who sets up idols in his heart, he said, I will grab them by their heart. <laughs> and that is a powerful passage of scripture. Anyway, so it uses scripture and also reasoning to go through there to where they realize that they have broken every single one of the Ten Commandments. And so at the end of it, you ask them, have you broken any of these commandments even one time? So do you want to be judged by how well you kept the Ten Commandments? Yes or no? They're going to all say no. They're going to, this is an eye-opening experience for most people. Uh, they've all at least heard of the Ten Commandments. And they think, well, if I can keep them, I'll be all right. But you won't be. And then we go on with the rest of it. And each one has an illustration. The end of this passage, and by the way, some pictures in here are pretty vivid. Like on page 10, the young woman looking at herself in the mirror. How would your human body appear if you ate food as often as you studied the Bible? So, I mean, this will, it, there's pictures in there to grab your attention. I use a lot of artificial intelligence uh, to get some of these pictures. Um, do you like my picture of the devil walking about as a roaring lion? That's pretty scary. <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, the devil can be pretty scary if you don't have the Spirit of God working in your life. Uh, he's still scary. Uh, he wants to kill and steal and destroy. At the end of it, I leave them with uh, this poem to read. And this is a beautiful poem, and boy, does it prick the heart. What you're doing is you're using Scripture and some emotion to lead them to Christ. It's not just all... Okay, yes, no, true, false, this kind of stuff. We, we, we want them to start talking about their emotions and how they feel and how that they've never seen some of this stuff before and that they need to learn it. Oh, the snow, the beautiful snow, fill your sky. Huh? I'm on page 12. Okay. This, story, this is a story of a 16-year-old girl who was raised in a fine home. She was well educated, but she got caught in the act of adultery with a married man. And because of that, she was cast out of her house, never to return. Being a scarlet woman, she could only turn to prostitution for her livelihood. At the age of 21, they found her lying face down in the snow. They rushed her to the Cincinnati Hospital, and there she died in the late 1800s. On her person, there was not much of anything of value except this poem. And the poem was entitled, The Beautiful Snow. And here's some of it. Oh, the snow, the beautiful snow, filling the sky and the earth below. Over the housetops, over the streets, over the heads of the people you meet. Dancing, flirting, skimming along, beautiful snow, it can do no wrong. Flying like the kiss of a fair lady's cheek, clinging to the lips and frolicsome freak, beautiful snow from the heavens above, pure as an angel and gentle as love. Once I was like the snow, but I fell. Fell like the snowflakes from heaven to hell. Fell to be trampled like filth in the streets. Fell to be trampled. I fell to be cursed, spat on and beat. Pleading, cursing, dreading to die, selling my soul to whomever would buy, dealing in shame for a morsel of bread, hating the living and fearing the dead. Merciful God, have I fallen so low? And yet I was once like the beautiful snow. How strange it should be that this beautiful snow should fall on the center with nowhere to go. How strange it would be when the night comes again if the snow and the ice struck my desperate rain. 
fainting, freezing, dying alone, too wicked for prayer, too weak for a moan to be heard in the streets of this crazy town, gone mad in the snow of the joy, mad in the snow, joy of the snow coming down. To lie and to die in my terrible woe for the bed and the shroud of the beautiful snow. You can see how pausing here really helps bring out the emotion of this. Now this point was sent that evening to the Cincinnati paper and the next day it was published. One poet was so touched by the poem that he paid for her final resting place and his hundreds followed her body to that place. He had prepared a tombstone. And on that tombstone these words are written as a plea to all lost and broken soul today. Helpless and frail as the trampled snow, sinner despair not, Christ stoops for him. To rescue the soul that was lost in its sin and raise it to life and enjoyment again, groaning, bleeding, dying for thee, the crucified hung was made a curse on the tree. His accents of mercy fall soft on thine ear, is there mercy for me? Will he heed my weak prayer? O oh God, in the streams that for sinners doth flow, wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. So do you know that you know that you would be with Jesus if you died right now? Let's continue to study the rest of the story. Then you come back next week and you do lesson number two. My son did this on, AI, on artificial intelligence, uh, this picture of Jesus with the children. And I th just think it's wonderful, except the little child he's holding has a man's hand. But anyway, that's okay. <laughs> that's what AI does for you. She's had a rough life. <laughs> she had a rough life, yeah. <laughs> she was put through a hand right there. I don't know, anyway. So, uh, Anyway, so you start talking about Jesus. We won't go into this because of time. Uh, but you can, can go home and read it. And, uh, and it talks about Jesus Christ. Uh, and I love this uh, little, little statement by, written by, uh, on page uh, 16 by uh, Dr. James Francis in 1926. He was born in an obscure village. The child of a peasant woman. He grew up in another obscure village where he worked in a carpenter. He was 30 when public opinion began turning against him. He never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. He seldom visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from where he was born. He did none of the things that usually associated with greatness. He had no credentials but himself. He was only 33 when his friends went, ran away. One of them denied him. Another betrayed him. He was turned over to his enemies and went through the mockery of six trials in 24 hours. He was nailed to a cross between two thieves. And while dying, his executioners gambled for his clothing. The only property he had on earth. When he was dead, he was laid in a borrowed grave through the pity of a friend. Almost 20 centuries have come and gone, and today, Jesus is the central figure of humanity and the leader of mankind's progress. All the armies that have ever marched, all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments and governments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together, have not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. Isn't that beautiful? Mm -hmm. we need, when you convert people to the gospel, you need to convert them to Jesus. Not to a form or to a church, but to Jesus. That's why the whole lesson is on Jesus. And I don't have time to go into it, but it goes in to the horror that he went through uh, in his passion. And, uh, and then it has a, uh, a, another illustration. And on page 23 is a real gut-wrenching question. 
He says, uh, can, can you invite Jesus to come into this? This is why He died. So that you can die with Him. And be recreated into something truly beautiful inside. The question is asked. You might say that Jesus looked on the outside. What we look like on the inside. And then you go through and you talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you're setting them up for lesson number two. Lesson number three is Jesus and salvation. The death, the burial, and the resurrection is the gospel or good news of Jesus. You cannot receive salvation, the Holy Spirit, or the blood of Christ unless you join with Jesus in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. Does that mean that you literally have to die on the cross with Jesus? Yes or no? What if God asked you to do that right now? Would you do it? Yes or no? Make a list of all the things you would not do for Jesus. Can you think of a list there that you could write down? <laughs> You're setting them up, see, for the gospel to be presented. And the gospel is fully presented in its power about uh, salvation. It talks about belief and faith. The first thing we have to do, page 31, we must repent. And repentance is often a forgotten element when we're teaching the gospel. And then you have to confess. In Jesus Christ. And we use the full, that's why I like the New King James Version because they don't cut anything out and put it in the footnotes. You know, you, you have basically a much better translation. And, uh, and it even explains to Catholics about Peter. You know, that Jesus didn't build the church on Peter, he built it on his confession. And then, uh, because you don't know who you're talking to, we're dealing with. And one more thing Satan does not want you to know. It is now time for the greatest event in your life, the time when you truly join yourself with Jesus, the moment God puts to death the old man of sin, page 34, and creates a new life. Baptism is our response to the gospel of Christ, but you must have a true understanding before you do it so that you will know that you know that you know. Now let's put the whole picture together. The word baptism means to dip, plunge, or immerse. But the word in the original Greek language, baptizo, was also used to describe sunken ships at sea or when someone drowned. So if someone was drowning, one of their family members would run through for help. Baptize, baptize. And they would come because they were drowning. And so it goes into, by the way, what's the first mention in the Old Testament of baptism? The first reference to it. It's kind of a kind of a roundabout reference, but it's in Isaiah 1 and 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are red like crimson. They will be as wool. How is that a reference to baptism? Because baptism was also used for the dyeing, color dyeing process. And you had to put every single inch, milliliter of that dye into there. Now, you could turn white into scarlet, but how easy was it for them to turn scarlet into white? How easy is it for us today to turn scarlet into white? It's nearly impossible. It can be done today. But it couldn't be done then. And so it was, this was one of the first allusions to baptism in, among the prophets. And uh, of course we know that uh, the crossing of the Red Sea from 1 Corinthians 10 was an allusion to baptism as well. Well, we go on down 
and we have uh, pictures and we compare them to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's an ugly old man in there uh, baptizing a, a recent convert, a new convert, and she, she uh, volunteered to pose for me. And uh, she was a sweet, she was a sweet little girl, and uh, I hope she's doing well now. Uh, anyway, uh, it talks about what happens when you go down in the water. What happens when you come up out of the water. And then, in, uh, and then you come to uh, page, page 42, and you ask them this question. After you've presented the gospel, and they've read the gospel for themselves, see, they're reading it. They don't have to take the time to go look it up. Now, in the foundations for disciples, they do have to look it up in their Bible. Because we want them to start using their Bible. We only do this so that they, uh, we can go through the lesson and let the power of the Word work on them. Uh, so you ask them, where do you stand with God right now? Saved, lost, or not sure? The ones that said saved will still say saved. The one that says lost will be very few. And the others will say, well, I'm not sure now. Then you take your envelope with your name on it and compare it to the conversion of Saul or Paul in Acts chapter 8. You read this and on page 43 at the bottom. Now let's compare your salvation and your envelope that you told me with, with Saul's. Did you have a supernatural experience? Was Paul saved at the point of his supernatural vision? Were you sprinkled as a baby? Was Paul sprinkled? Did Paul have to be told what to do to be saved? Can a baby understand or need salvation? Can a baby believe, repent, confess? Was there an example of anyone in the Bible sprinkled as a baby? Yes or no? Did you pray the sinner's prayer for salvation? Does the Bible state that Saul was praying? Yes or no? It did. For three days and three nights. Does it say he prayed the sinner's prayer? Yes or no? Was he saved at the moment he started praying? Yes or no? Does the Bible give any example of someone being saved by saying this prayer? The following is authored by a famous denominational preacher. I put Billy Graham at first because this is from him, but you know, you don't want to offend people. You're trying to teach them the truth. And so they read this and they say, yeah, that's what I said. Okay. <clears throat> Did this prayer come from God? Yes or no? no? Can praying this prayer wash away your sins? Can this prayer cause you to die with Jesus Christ to be reborn? Did Paul or anyone else in the Bible pray this prayer for salvation? And then it goes on with some more uh, teaching. And then uh, one of the best passages I, I really uh, didn't think, ever think about for a long time was in uh, uh, Acts chapter uh, 8, where the Bible says, And Crispus, uh, excuse me, Acts 18. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. It explains there in Acts chapter 18 what it means to believe. <clears throat> Believing, hearing, and being baptized. So you ask him, did you do this? Did you understand this when you were baptized you know, three months later or whatever, or when you were baptized as a baby. And then it asks a lot of yes or no questions. And, and these are important. Because you don't want to just dunk them and then funk them, is what we call it. You want to baptize them, and you want them to be prepared to continue on. So you ask them, are you on page 3046, are you ready to repent and turn from your old way of thinking and take hold of eternal life? Yes or no? Would you be willing to confess the name of Jesus now and forever before the world? 
Are you willing to be uh, die and be buried with Christ? If you are baptized, will you commit to being faithful to worship with the family of God every time they meet? You know, I've, I've heard of uh, door knocking campaigns where eight or nine people were baptized and they didn't show up on Sunday. And they went back and asked him and says, oh, I didn't know I had to come to your church. I just kept going to mine. Well, you need to discuss that before they're baptized. If you have not been added to the Lord's church by, by God, by being baptized, what are you waiting for? And then, of course, today, if you hear his heart. So you've already had one closing with this, and you've compared it to Paul's conversion. Now you have one more closing. And I love this one. Many a time I've seen people just break down with tears in their eyes when they do this. And what they do is, on page 47, they write their name in the blank. And they, not you, they read it out loud. Jonathan? Sorry, I was highlighting the scripture. All right, page 47. Come unto me, I know you are tired of sin and your heart is burdened with fears. you got to so, say your name. Oh, my name. Okay. Yeah. Come unto me, Jonathan. I know that you are tired of sin and your heart is burdened with guilt and fears. So, Jonathan, I want you to take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am meek and humble in heart. And for the first time in your life, you can find rest in your soul. For unlike the yoke of sin and death, my yoke is easy. In my burden is light. Jonathan, will you join me in my death, my burial, and in my resurrection by being baptized right now? Love, Jesus. So what is your answer to Jesus Christ? You see, you're letting Jesus invite them at the end. And then that beautiful baptism picture on page 48, where an elder baptized someone in the lake, Quartz Mountain Lake, and I love that. It's my favorite baptism picture. And so you ask them, will you do, and now you know the rest of the story of Jesus. Was there anything he did not do for you? This is when people in the Bible were baptized immediately, the same day, at the same hour. We can go to the church building where there is water. This is very important. Where there is water, clothing is prepared, Towels are ready, and Jesus is waiting. Once we get there, it will only take a few minutes to make the first step toward a glorious eternity. Will you do this for Jesus? And, and you see, it's not you, it's not the Church of Christ doing it, it's Jesus. Now then, we're going to hand this out, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do this one on this side. Don't forget the cards. Oh yeah, I'll go over the cards real quick while you're while I'm handing that out. If you would like, and I have enough for y'all to get an extra copy. We promised two copies a piece. Uh, and so that you can practice this on somebody at home and see how it works. See how it flows. If you want to order this for your church, the cost on this is Zippo. Everything that, that Home Mission makes and does is free. And uh, if you want Home Mission to come and do a workshop or whatever, we have a, a man that will call you and do a Zoom with your leaders. Uh, he did a Zoom with y'all, Steve, didn't he? Yeah, I think he did. Yeah. And he, they wanted to know what this Home Mission mess is all about. <laughs> anyway. Okay, now, all of, while that's being passed around, I want to go over this card with you. This is one of the many tools that we have, and this is what we do in our first workshop called the Launch Session. And it's the STARS card. Daniel 12 and 2 said, uh, talks about those who lead many to righteousness are like the stars in the sky. It's one of the most beautiful passages on evangelism in the Bible. And then we get them to write their ten down. <clears throat> when I was baptized into Christ, the preacher came up after me and he put his arm around me as a little old boy. And he said, son, now that somebody has taught you the gospel, I want you to go bring ten people to Christ. 
I pastored my two best friends to death until they were baptized. One of them grew up to be a deacon in the church. One of them died of a drug overdose in his 20s. Mm -hmm. You never know. And I've been working on 10 and then another 10 and another 10. And, and the point is, is that from that very moment, that preacher inspired me to bring people to Christ. I wish I had this too from then on to talk to people because this tool is a compilation of a lot of evangelists that I know of, a lot of work through the years. When we were at Faith Village, we had, a, God gave us an average of a baptism or a restoration every week for eight years. And uh, that's what God can do. If His Word is used, because the power is not in you, the power is in the Word. And when you use the Word, they can't, they can't, they get to lesson number three, they're not likely to, to disobey that. I, I, I ask, I, I recommend that you don't just use lesson three on unless they only have one time, one uh, time for a lesson. Set it up where you can take time with it. We are too big of a hurry to get them in the water because we want the numbers. No, take the time because when you go through this book, you're going to help ground them in what they need to be grounded in. And then you go into the foundations. And if you're good at evangelism, then get somebody else to teach the foundations to follow up. But they need to be there at the baptism when that person is drip drying and they need to set up the study for the foundations. It's 17 lessons. And they need that desperately. Now then, uh, how do you work your 10? You pray for them every day. You study, you study yourself and prepare for yourself. You connect with them and you gift them when you get a chance. Giving gifts opens the doors to important people, Proverbs 18 says. And uh, I gave a gift to Colonel Sanders one time. And I got to eat breakfast with him at 5 o'clock in the morning. Now, I would have never gotten to eat breakfast with Colonel Sanders if I hadn't <laughs> given him a gift. <laughs> and now the back teaches you how to get a Bible study in 15 minutes. Okay. You use the hopes method. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to make friends with them and get to know them. You'll learn things about them you don't know. In fact, if you'll use this hopes method on members of your congregation, you'll learn more about them and you'll learn and you'll connect with them. Okay, I said I was going to get through and I get through real early, but, but I want to do a little practice on this. Can I get a volunteer? Somebody be willing to volunteer? Well, come on. Y'all yeah, are pointing at each other. Come on down. You're the next contestant on the prize is wrong. <laughs> okay, if you look at this, I'm going to ask him hope. I'm going to ask him about his home, occupation, preferences, entertainment, and then I want his religious story. That's where you can write down or you can make a note of that, and then when you get the Bible study, you can even write it down more. Hello, my name's John Ort. I'm Pierce. Pierce, glad to meet you. Um, any your last name in Brosnan, is it? No. <laughs> Not with her. Okay, see, what you're, what you're trying to do is make connections with me. So, um, are you kin to the Whitners in... Uh, in Wyoming? No, not that I know of. Okay, well I don't know any witnesses in Wyoming. <laughs> <laughs> You're trying to make connections with it. Where, uh, where are you from? Uh, I moved to Lubbock from Arizona. Arizona? What part of Arizona? Uh, middle of nowhere. Middle of nowhere. My dad's a minister in uh, Coolidge. Coolidge, Arizona. Mm -hmm. Well that is great. That is great. Uh, so how big is the congregation there? About 40 people. 40? 45. <laughs> Well, let him know about home mission. It's all free. We pay our own way. So, um, so uh, uh, were you born and raised in Coolidge, or did you travel with your father wherever he went? Wherever he went. <laughs> I was born in the Dallas area. 
Well, I was a preacher's son too, so <laughs> I know I know your heartache. Uh, I had to move my senior year. That was tough. From Houston to Memphis, Texas. <laughs> Memphis is not a bad place. It's just what Houston. Anyway, so uh, what do you do for a living? Uh, I'm a student at Sunset right now. Good, good. And are you planning to preach? Uh, I'd like to do youth and family preferably. Youth and family. Well, great. That's wonderful. Well, this is a great school that you're going to. And uh, I sent my, many of my children to Sunset. He graduated from the, um, from the uh, Sunset... Um, the Satellite? Satellite School. Yeah. Oh, okay. External Studies. Yeah. Nice. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> so where were you born? I was born in the, I was in Richardson, so right outside of Dallas. Yeah, I know where Richardson is. Uh, do you know where Waterview is? Yeah, I've Waterview. been to Waterview a couple of times. Well, they're one of our supporting congregations. No kids. They really are. They're great people there. So, uh, what do you like, what's your favorite food? I've been really liking this ramen place here in Lubbock. Have you? Yeah, I have. I haven't had ramen from there yet, but it's a good place. <laughs> so you, you get the ramen from Walmart? Yeah. And you feast on that? Yeah, yeah. That's a good food for a, for a preaching student. <laughs> <laughs> Mac and cheese is too. So. Uh, well, I remember when we went to preaching school, uh, we would, uh, they would bring a bunch of uh, uh, bin cans and stuff like that up there and, sure. and have soda, <coughs> one of the sodas sprayed all over them and we'd go we through that. We have to stay awake somehow. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. so uh, what's your favorite, if you could pick out any restaurant in the world, what's your favorite restaurant you'd like to eat at? I miss In-N-Out Burger. In and out burger. I miss I miss In and Out a little bit. They it's good fast it. food. Yeah. It's just a good good burger. Good burger. Yeah. Well, I've eaten there before. It's not bad. No, it's not. Not bad. My son likes Five Guys. Okay. Yeah. I've been to Five Guys once or twice. Yeah, they got one here. I yeah, I really like it. I really like Five Guys too. <laughs> 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 but uh, so, uh, um, where uh, what do you do for entertainment? Uh, I like some movies. I like to play video games. Uh huh. Yeah. What's your favorite movie? What's my favorite movie? I don't know if I have a favorite favorite. I really like the Barbie movie this year. It's oh, did you? Yeah. So really? Mm -hmm. Do you know I got nominated for a Academy Award? I heard about that. Yeah. I heard about that. So my wife stayed about my wife and I stayed about ninety miles away from it. So and that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Anyway, we had enough of Barbies when we were raising kids. So, um, so what's your religious story? Um, I was born and raised in the church. Nothing too spicy or special. Mm -hmm. my, my dad and mom went about every Sunday, every Wednesday night sort of thing. And then my dad, when I was five or six, came here to Sunset. And so then I was here at Sunset, and then he's been a minister ever since. So Wonderful. I've just been around. Well, uh, so... Have you, are you, now that you've left home and you're coming to school, have you developed your own, are you developing your own faith? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Apart from your parents. Yeah. I, I've, I've been working on trying to make my own connections um, with other Christians and trying to stay uh, active and involved yeah. on, on my own. Uh, there, there are things that I can work on, but I, it's nice to find other supporters um, and, and people of the faith outside of the, the little group that I'm used to. So do you have a lot of questions that are unanswered? Um, no, not too many. My, the teachers have been really good about about that sort but of thing. But there's a few things that you probably wondered about. Yeah. yeah. So so could we get together and have a Bible study? Yeah, let's see why not. How about Tuesday or Thursday? What time would be a good time? Um, any time after 4.30. Okay. Well, give him a hand, folks. <laughs> okay, you see how you can set up a study in 15 minutes. You'll use that. You, but you have to make connections with them. 
And, and, and a little humor is, is great. It really cuts the ice. And so, well, thank you so much for being with us. And how many of y'all know Lead Me to Some Soul today? How many of you know that song? Anybody? Sort of, kind of? Well, sing it with me. Lead me to some souls today. Oh, teach me, Lord, just what to say. Friends of mine are lost in sin and cannot find their way. Few there are who seem to care, and few there are who pray. Melt my heart and fill my life, give me one soul today. Melt my heart and fill my life. Give me one soul today. Thank you so much. How many of y'all would like an extra copy of the Okay. Y'all want an extra copy? Oh, I think you've read the other Okay. Do you want an extra one? Sure. That way you can study with somebody. Right. Right. Johnson, you want to have a place? How about if we want one day to come, come grab it so we're not like just handing it to people? Well, I like handing it to Randy.